Okay, so now we are going to start something completely different. Okay. Although secretly it's not secretly, this is all going to be related to fixed points, but we won't see how until well into the semester. And this is 3.1. And the title is a mouthful, second order, linear, differential equations. So we've defined order and we've defined linear, but that was long ago in our very first lesson. So let's make sure we all remember what we mean by this. A second order linear Differential equation is a differential equation that looks like that. Um, the important, I mean, let's see, what's important here? Well, we've got the second order, second derivative. We've got the first derivative. We've got the original function. It's helpful to think of these as polynomial was essentially polynomial, except that instead of powers, we have derivatives. Um, these functions out front, this A, this B, this C, are allowed to depend on X, but not Y. That is, they're allowed to depend on the independent variable, but not the dependent variable. Similarly, the function on the right of the equality sign. Um, What we're actually going to look at most in this class is very special second order linear differential equations where these functions are all just constants. And we're mostly going to look at second order linear differential equations where that function on the right is a constant two is the constant zero function. Let me call this our main case. But today we're going to state some definitions. We're going to state some theorems that apply for any second order of linear differential equation. Or if not any second order of linear differential equation, at least to any A of X, B of X and C of X, I said that we're often going to look at cases where f of x is zero, and that case is so important that it gets its own name. If f of x is the zero function, we call the equation homogeneous. For reasons I'm not clear totally about, homo for same, but I'm not sure what's the same as what. Anyway, we're going to mostly be looking at homogeneous equations in this class.
So linear differential equations are less interesting for their applications than as a tool to study non-linear differential equations. It's kind of a weird situation where people write entire books on these things, and then you ask them, well, are there a lot of these differential equations in the real world? And it's no, we're writing entire books on these, but we're not interested in them for their own merit. We're interested in how we can use them to study different differential equations. A little odd, as I say, but we can come up with a real world second order linear differential equation. Let's say that we have a spring and at the end of the spring, we have some kind of mass. And if the spring is allowed to rest, the mass will be in some kind of resting position. Now, let's take this spring, let's take this mass, and let's pull it to the right. So the spring stretches out. And let's call the distance that we stretch the spring out x. So when we release the mass, the spring will compress, and the mass will go back to its resting position. And let's ask ourselves, when we release the spring, what forces are at work? And I mean, ordinarily, the only force at work is the force of the spring. And the force of the spring, we'll call it F sub S, is usually going to be minus K times X where K is the spring constant. And as far as why this is true, I couldn't tell you, but it's a known result. It's called Hooke's law. So in a lot of situations where we have an object attached to a spring, we don't want that object being violently moved by the spring. I mean, if we're, we have a lot of violent movement, the spring will wear out and eventually stuff will stop working. So we're going to put an additional Thing into our system, we're going to put a shock absorber into the system. So now, when we release this object, the force of the spring is going to yank it to the left, but there's going to be an opposing force, the force of the shock absorber that stops it going to the left too violently. This force is going to have a constant in it, just like k, and it's going to have the velocity in it. 
So a shock, a shock absorber isn't intended to stop the spring from going to its default position. The shock absorber is just intended to ensure that it doesn't do it too quickly. So as long as the object is moving slowly, as long as the velocity is close to zero, this force is also going to be close to zero. But if the object is moving very quickly, if the velocity is a large, it will be negative. If the velocity is a large negative number, then that will make this force large as well, and we'll have a stiff resistance. So low velocity, the shock absorber isn't doing a lot. High velocity, the shock absorber kicks in. Why is there a negative sign in front of this force? Well, because in the situation we have diagrammed on the board, we think of positive movement as movement to the right. We think of negative movement as movement to the left. Positive and negative velocity, I meant to say. So when we release this object, it's going to go to the left. The velocity will be negative. And the point of this negative sign is to make this force positive. And we want this force to be positive because it's a force to the right. It's pushing the object towards the right. Or So we've got the force of the spring, the force of the shock absorber. We've got this famous law of Newton, that force equals mass times acceleration. And force is additive meaning that to find this total force F, we just take the component forces and we add them together. Mass times acceleration is negative Kx minus Cv. And now it looks like we have all of these, you know, we've got an M and an A and a K and an X and a C and a V. But um, some of these are secretly derivatives. Well, I don't know how secret it is. We learn it in calculus one that the velocity is a derivative. And the acceleration is a second derivative. So suddenly a lot of these letters go away. And now we just have the mass and that K, that um, spring constant, and that C, that shock absorber constant. And if we bring everything 
So one side of this differential equation, it's linear, it's second order. And as a matter of fact, It's homogeneous. We also make the observation. It has what we call constant coefficients. You know, when I put the definition for linear second order differential equations on the board, I said, well, we can have functions. You know, A of X, B of X, C of X, F of X. And then I said, but for us, our main cases are going to be where instead of having functions, we just have constants. And you see in the shock absorber example, that's exactly where we are wind up. We have um, just constants in front of the derivatives. Now, let me state some results relating to the solution of these second order linear differential equations. And this first theorem, I mean, I already said way back in the beginning of class that we were just going to assume that all the differential equations we looked at had solutions. It is indeed true that every second order linear differential equation. And there's a phrase I'm going to get sick of writing before the end of the semester. Every second order linear differential equation has at least one solution. We do have minor requirements for this theorem to work. You know, for this class, these functions are going to almost always be constants. Skip B. But if they're not, constant, they should at least be continuous for this theorem to hold. Again, that's not really going to be an issue for us. We're only going to look at continuous functions in this class. And now, and you know, you know a theorem is important when it gets its own name. The superposition principle. So the superposition principle only applies to a certain class of second order linear differential equations. Let's say we have
a second order differential equation that looks like this. It has to be homogeneous. That is absolutely necessary for the superposition principle to work. There has to be that zero on the right-hand side. Uh, traditionally, we write this assuming there's nothing in front of that second derivative. That's less essential. In the sense that, well, I probably shouldn't go all the way back here. Should probably just start a new frame. In the sense that suppose you have a homogeneous differential equation, and there's something in front of the y double prime. Now, we can divide both sides by that something. We get y double prime plus b of x over a of x y prime plus c of x over a of x y equals zero. And you say, instead of writing b of x over a of x, I mean, this is a function. I'm going to give it a name. I'll call it P of X. And instead of C of X over A of X, this is a function. I'll give it a name. I'll call it Q of X. Now well, you see we've transformed this differential equation so that it looks just like the differential equation on the previous frame. Um, looking ahead just a little, we're going to do some factoring in this class and factoring a quadratic is easier if there's nothing in front of the first term, and that's why. But for now, we can simply accept it, that usually if there is something in front of the y double prime, we rewrite it so that there isn't. So, I was going to state the superposition principle. Suppose you have an equation like this, then if y sub one and y sub two are both solutions, So is any linear combination of y sub one and y sub two. So we can use solutions to build new solutions. Let's see 
this. Let's look at y double prime plus y equals zero. So this is homogeneous in second order. Um, we're not bothering to write to the zero y prime, but you can think of it as being there if you want. Likewise, we're not bothering to write the constant function one in front of the y, but you can think of it as being there if you want. So here's a differential equation. We'll actually learn how to solve it before the end of the week. But for the moment, Let me just say that the cosine of x is a solution. And although we won't see right now where this is coming from, let's demonstrate that it is a solution. Y1 prime equals the negative sine of x y1 double prime equals the negative cosine of x. So y double prime plus y, I should say y1 double prime plus y1. It's the negative cosine of x plus the cosine of x. And that is indeed zero. The cosines cancel and leave us with the zero. Similarly, It turns out that the sine of x is a solution. We could demonstrate that if we wanted to, but let's just accept it. And what I'm now claiming is that any combination of the cosine and the sine is also a solution. So for example, two times the cosine of x minus seven, times the sine of x. This should also be a solution according to the superposition principle. And demonstrating that it is, is again a calculus exercise. The derivative of the cosine is the negative sine. The derivative of the sine is the cosine. Take the second derivative. The derivative of the sine is the cosine. The derivative of the cosine is the negative sine. And now our differential equation says that if we take y3 double prime and we add it to y3, we're supposed to get to zero. And 
of course, zero is exactly what we get. We have a positive cosine and a positive sine. And then we have a negative cosine and a negative sine. And all of that cancels and turns to zero. So Y3 is a solution. No matter what C1 is, no matter what C2 is. Two times the cosine minus seven times the sine is a solution. 19 eighths plus pa, 19 eighths times the cosine plus pi times the sine is a solution. No matter what the constants are, as long as they're linear combinations of other solutions, the superposition principle says they are solutions. Again, I really must stress that the superposition principle only works when we have homogeneous equations. So a question that you might ask in one sense, slightly naive, but in another sense, logical enough, is what's the superposition principle for? That is to say, suppose our goal was to solve this differential equation. Well, we solved it when we found the cosine, and we solved it again when we found the sine. So, why isn't that enough? If we already have solutions, why do we need to create more solutions? And the easiest way to answer that problem, that question, is that the superposition principle lets us deal with initial value problems. Let's put this on the board again. But this time, let's say that we have some initial conditions that we want to satisfy. And we solve this differential equation, no matter how we do it, we'll see how on Thursday, I hope, but we solve this differential equation and we find, oh, okay, the sine is a solution to this differential equation. But, the sign does not satisfy these initial conditions. I mean, the sign of zero is not one. The sign of zero is zero. So we found the sign, we found a solution, but it's not the solution we're looking for. So we try again. And this time we find the cosine. And initially, maybe we feel a little optimistic because the cosine of zero is one. But the derivative of the cosine at zero is not one half. 
the derivative of the cosine at zero is zero. So this is a little discouraging because we found two solutions, but neither of them works. So how long do we have to keep doing this? Do we have to go back and now look for a third solution? Well, here's where the superposition principle comes into play. The superposition principle says, well, if we found these two solutions, we can use the two solutions that we found to build a bunch of solutions. I'm calling it Y3, but Y3 is an infinite class because every C1, C2 combination gives us a solution. So what I'm calling Y3 is really an infinite collection of solutions. It includes two times the sine plus three times the cosine. It includes one times the sine minus four sevenths times the cosine and so on. And now let's see why three of zero is C2. I mean, doing the trigonometry in my head, which maybe I shouldn't. Y3 of zero is that, but the sine of zero is zero, and the cosine of zero is one. So we get that y3 of zero equals c2. And we want it to be one. So we'd better let c2 be one. And now we satisfy that first initial condition. Y3 of zero does equal one. What about the second initial condition? Well, Y3 prime is C1 times the cosine of X minus the sine of X. So Y3 prime of zero is C1 times the cosine of zero minus the sine of zero. which is C1. And we want the derivative at zero to be one half. So we say, okay, cool. If we just make C1 be one half, then now we satisfy that second initial condition. Any questions about anything so far? Anything you'd like me to go back over? Then what we did here is pretty typical of how we use the superposition principle. So let's say we're in the following situation. We want to solve 
a second quarter linear homogeneous differential equation. Always such a mouthful. And we've also got initial conditions. Now, somehow or other, we find, and again, I'm going to teach you that. So this somehow or other, I'm being vague for the moment, but we'll see how. Somehow or other, we find multiple solutions, but neither of the solutions we find satisfy the initial condition. Well, we've said this before, every differential equation has an infinite number of solutions. I mean, assuming it has any. Yeah. Um, it's not going to be productive to just keep sticking our hand into that fact where there are infinitely many solutions and pulling them out and hoping that this time the one we pull out is going to be the one we need to satisfy the initial condition. Instead, what we do is we use the superposition principle to find, let's call the solutions we found F1 and F2. We use the superposition principle to find or maybe create would be a better word. an infinite class of solutions. A constant times the first solution, plus a constant times a second solution. Then finally, find the values C1 and C2, that make F3 satisfy our initial conditions. So this is how the superposition principle is used, or at least it's one way that the superposition principle is used. And it's a very, um, how should I say this? It's a very reliable way of solving second order linear homogeneous differential equations. Like there's no possibility that you'll get to this last step and not be able to find C1 and C2. This method just works. There's only one thing we need for this method to work, 
And that's stated informally. That's that the two solutions we find need to be different enough. And to see what I mean by that, let's go back to y double prime plus y equals zero, y of zero equals one, y prime of zero equals one half. And I find that the sine of x is a solution, but the sine of zero is not one. The sine of zero is zero, so this is not the solution that we're looking for. Then I say, okay, let's find a new solution. And I somehow figure out that two times the sine of x is a solution. Unfortunately, two times the sine of zero is not one, it's zero. So this is not what I am looking for. So I say, okay, neither of these solutions is the one I'm looking for. Let's use the superposition principle. to create a new solution. And now let's try to make this new solution satisfy the initial conditions. Well, you can't though. Y sub three of zero is still zero. It's always going to be zero. Because the sine of zero is zero. So this product is zero, no matter what C1 is. And this product is zero, no matter what C2 is. And zero plus zero equals zero. So this method I outlined failed here, but it's probably intuitive that there's, as far as finding multiple solutions goes, the sine of x and twice the sine of x is different somehow than the sine of x and the cosine of x. And we can formalize our intuition with the following definition. Two functions f of x and g of x are called linearly dependent if one is a product of the other. Oh, 
otherwise, as one might suspect, they are called independent. So here, where we used the superposition principle and it didn't work, the two functions we had were dependent. Here, where we used the superposition principle and it did work. The functions we had were independent. And it is not a coincidence that this method worked for the independent functions and didn't work for the dependent functions. I'm now going to put a series of, I guess you could call them theorems on the board. Theorem. Any linear, homogeneous second order differential equation has two Linearly independent solutions. I'm stating this a little informally. In the sense that in the sense that you might have F and G and they're linearly independent and you might have H and K and they're linearly independent. So, um, you know, I say two, what I'm trying to get at here is that we can always find two solutions that are linearly independent from each other. I'm not trying to say there definitely aren't other solutions, but we can always find a set of two linearly independent solutions. Definition, these linearly independent solutions, I'd better give them names, F and G, using the superposition principle, on F and G this is why that word homogeneous is in that list you cannot use the superposition principle unless they're homogeneous but using the superposition principle to create a equals C1 F of X plus C2 
g of x. And let me go ahead and use that notation for all of these. Wrong tense. So we use the superposition principle to create this new solution, which I'm calling a new solution, but again, is really an infinite number of solutions because every value of C1 and C2 gives a different solution. So what's the definition Well, the definition is that this is called the general solution. And then the reason the general solution is called the general solution I guess we don't really have a lot of space here. Theorem. Say you have a differential equation as described in the last I am already heartily sick of writing down linear homogeneous second order differential equation. Then there are two linearly independent solutions, and you can create the general solution. That's what this frame says. And suppose further, you have an initial condition. which would normally take the form of a value for the function and a value for the derivative. Then you can select C1 and C2 in this general solution, h of x equals c1 f of x plus c2 g of x. You can select c1 and c2 such that h of x solves the initial value problem. So what we did a while ago, we gave a second order linear homogeneous differential equation with some initial condition. We found two linearly independent solutions. We used the superposition principle to create the general solution. C1 times the first solution plus C2 times the second solution. And then we were able to find a value of C1 and a value of C2 that satisfied those initial conditions that made y of zero be one and y prime of zero be one half. So what I'm saying now is this always works. 
thoughts. Anytime we're faced with a situation like this, we can find two solutions. We can use the superposition principle to create the general solution. And then we can find C1 and C2 so that the general solution satisfies the initial condition. So this is a very powerful tool. What we're missing at the moment is a way of finding the two linearly independent solutions in the first place. I mean, I told you that the sine of x and the cosine of x were solutions, but how did I know that? So that missing piece of the puzzle will fill in on Thursday.